And now, your prayer intentions with author Peter and Jimmy. Hello and welcome. We're delighted to spend the next half hour with you to pray for your prayer intentions today on WQPH 89.3 FM. I want to especially thank those of you who have just come down and are still listening after listening to the 13th Apostle. And of course, before that, our show, Local Matters. And don't forget to stay tuned to WQPH because when we're done here, it will be Talk Catholic. So a full two hours of local programming here on WQPH. And of course, we welcome all those who are listening from other areas who are carrying the show. So whether you're listening on WQPH or whether you're listening someplace else, we're delighted to have you. Now, we've got a lot to talk about and another good interview. This was, Today's interview is going to be with Barbara Gold of the uh, Catholic detective slash fiction writer. So you're going to enjoy the first part of that interview. But we have a couple of events coming up that I want to clue you in on. The first one is going to be a prayer, a rosary. That's going to be at noon at St. Bernard's Parish at St. Camilla's Church on Mechanic Street in Fitchburg. That's coming up in October on the 10th. I will be uh, leading the rosary there. So we'd be delighted to have you there. It's We're going to be praying in front of the uh, pro-life monument. And we'll be very, very delighted to have you there to share with us. And we have a larger event coming up. It's not specifically a WQPH event, as neither as nor is the event I just told you about. But we're planning a Eucharistic procession in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, to pray for the country. The date is going to be uh, October twenty fourth. The procession will start at eleven and will end with a mass for the country at noon. Again at St. Bernard's Parish at St. Camilla's Church. I will give more details. We've filed the paperwork with the city, and I will give you more details as time comes on. If if it turns out to be a rainy day, we'll have the mass and we'll and bless the country with the monstrous from the church. And we have a couple of uh, backup plans in case the initial request is turned down for the procession. So keep those two dates open: the uh, 10th of October and the 24th of October. 10th of October, Rosary. And the 24th Eucharistic Procession and Mass. So you can't go wrong with those type of things. Well, speaking of things that are going wrong, we're going to now start our list of prayer requests and remind you that if you have prayer intentions, there's three ways that you can get them to us. You can email us at wqph893 at comcast.net. That's wqph893 at comcast.net. You can tweet us at Radio WQPH. And we'll get the intentions. But the best way remains to post it on our prayer wall at wqphradio.org slash prayer wall. The nice thing about the prayer wall is not only do I see your prayer requests, but everyone else sees them and can leave a reply. And just one more reminder, you can put as much or as little information as you want. Just put You can just put prayer requests because God knows what's in your heart. If you don't want to share what you need prayers for, that's perfectly fine. So, all of that being said, let's get to our prayer requests. We have our standing prayer requests, of course, for Nancy over at the Highlands. We're thinking of you for Mary Lots, for the local priests and bishops in the area, for the uh, all the listeners in the parishes that, that we serve here at WQPH, for the donors of WQPH, who we could not exist without you. And just as a reminder, if you want to give us a hand, there's a handy donate button at the WQPH radio.org website, so you can help us out there. Uh, and, of course, standing requests for conversions, conversions, conversions. We get, I tell you, that's, it's still the most popular request. And a request for a, a long list that I was given, and it's literally too long to read. So we're going to just do a blanket request for the people on that list because it would take too many shows to read them all, frankly. There's just a lot of them. So a prayer request for the people on those lists we have another prayer request from the prayer wall again for the uh two officers who were shot in la and we have some prayer requests online let's get to the online requests sharon is having a hysterectomy and she's asking for prayers we're very delighted to 
and do that prayer request for her. We have Marty, who is not giving details, but says bad things are happening to him and his family and girlfriend. So, of course, very happy to offer prayers there. Luke says he's falling back into habitual sin. And that's something that we all have to deal with. So we were very happy to pray for Luke. A uh, person who gives their name as Pumpkin has two relatives who just learned that they had COVID. So prayers there. Katie uh, is asking for prayers for Claire, who's been a little iffy in terms of her health lately. So a prayer for Claire and a prayer for Katie too. I, something just told me to say pray for Katie, so we're going to do that. And Erica has a request for Laura. And Therese asks people just to pray for her. Again, no details, just asking for a prayer. We are more than happy to fulfill that request. And we will begin filling those requests now by praying the fourth mystery of light, the transfiguration on the mount. And we offer this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The fourth mystery of light is the transfiguration on the mount. We offer thee, O Lord Jesus, this ninth decade, and honor thy transfiguration on the mount. And we ask of thee, through this mystery and through the intercession of thy Holy Mother, to be transfigured into the Christian you wish us to be. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls into heaven, especially those who are most need in thy mercy. May the grace and mystery of the transfiguration on the mount come down to our souls. Amen. And we pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now for those of you who might have just caught the show for the first time and didn't get a chance to send in a prayer request, we're going to do a special uh, St. Michael prayer for you. And also I'm going to offer it for a small intention that I have that I'm not going to say out loud. And then we'll pray it in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in the day of battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. 
May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, and do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan, and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, for our interview with Barbara Golda, uh, part one of two, the book is Dying for Compassion. Hello and welcome to another day of interviews with Catholic authors and today we are here with an old friend of mine, Barbara Golder, who has a couple of books out for the Lady Doc series. The first one, which was out a while ago, is Dying for Revenge, The Lady Doc Murders, Book One. The second book is Dying for Compassion, The Lady Doc Murders, Book Two. Uh, that one came out in 2018. And Barbara, great to have you on the show. Oh, it's wonderful to be back. Good to see you. Well, now let's talk about the Lady Doc, the origin of this series. <laughs> Where did the Lady Doc come from, and who is the Lady Doc? Well, I'm told the Lady Doc bears a strong resemblance to me, even though I don't see it. I mean, she's a doctor and a lawyer, but it gives me the opportunity to deal with some issues that are really important, that affect everybody in one way or another, and to use a fictional character to do it and manipulate the world so that it comes out the way I want it to, which doesn't usually happen in real life. That's, that's always an issue for people of faith. Let's start with book one, Dying for Revenge. Talk about this first book. Well, the first book starts out with Jane Wallace, who is a Catholic woman. She's been married for a long time. Her husband is murdered, and she brings the murderers to justice, but it shatters her life, and she retreats to this little town of Telluride, Colorado, to sort of recover from it. She thinks that she can get away from the pain of, of her husband's death and the desire for revenge by moving to a different place, but she finds she can't because all of a sudden she's now having to deal with a serial killer in that town, and she finds to her surprise that she has a lot in common with this person, uh, the person she doesn't know yet, and it surprises her. And it's a, a study of how you go from the desire for revenge, which is, which is a very human desire, through mercy, through justice, to mercy in the course of the spiritual life. And so, and how she grows. So that's that's the story of Lady Dog, but it's a good mystery too. Now, how does Lady Dog get involved with the murders themselves? Since I mean, she's a doctor. Is she a forensic doc? She is. She's a forensic pathologist and a lawyer, and so she she plays both sides of the street. She gets to do both things, and and again, that's a, a bit autobiographical because I I did both jobs. These are jobs that you've dealt with a lot of very serious things, and you've seen a lot of serious stuff. Is this, in a way, cathartic for you to deal with all that you've seen and done in this in this field? It really is. It, there, there was a lot of catharsis in putting it together. There was a lot of integrating, which which is important. Uh, when you're going through this stuff, when you're when you're dealing with it as a professional, sometimes you have to keep it at, at arm's length because you don't have time to deal with it. And one of the things that doing the Lady Duck murders has done is give me the opportunity on paper to work through some of that in a way that makes sense for my life. So yeah, I think it really was cathartic. You're retired from both of these things or are you still active at all? I'm, I'm retired from both of those things. I'm not, I'm not doing either one in an active way, but they all inform what I do in my writing and, and in my bioethics, which is the other piece of my life. Now, of course, you're a member of the Catholic Writers Guild and this is a Catholic author show. So, to what degree does faith inform Our Lady Doctor in Book One? Part of the, the struggle in Book One was her coming back to faith because she's had probably the most horrible event happen to her that, that can happen to a married woman. Her husband has been killed almost in front of her eyes. And so she, and, and not only killed, but killed by one of her medical partners. So she's been betrayed by people and she's hurting from it. Now she's understandably mad at God and kind of mad at the church, but she stays connected because she knows that's what she needs to do, even if she doesn't know why. And so faith informs everything that happens in this book, but it informs it at a level that's sort of below the surface so that you could give this book to someone who's not Catholic and say, read this, it's just a really good mystery. And they would absorb, I think, some of the idea of, of what Catholics think about revenge, about justice, about mercy, about redemptive suffering, about the role of the sacraments in the church. So it's it's there, just like it's there in all of our lives. It's, it's not necessarily something that we carry around on a placard saying, yes, I'm Catholic, here's what I do. We simply live out our lives, and because our faith is important to us, it informs everything we do and it does for Jane even though she doesn't realize it. Now when you wrote the first book what year did the first book come out? It came out I have to think I was 2016 I think. All right, so 
you've done this job, you've been a lawyer, you've been a pathologist, and you write this book after you've retired. Now, you have no idea, of course, how this is going to be received. What made you decide to write a book? Was it, as I was hinting earlier, a cathartic or is it just something to do in retirement? or? It turned out to be cathartic, but it in, it started out because I, I had written for a... This is kind of a shaggy dog story, so work with me on this one. Don't worry, we have a long show. Well, not that long, but we'll, we'll see how long. It's not that big, not that, not that big a shaggy dog. Um, there's a friend of my husband's uh, from high school that we've known off and on all our married life, and she periodically would, we would sort of connect with her, and after I uh, retired, uh, she connected with us again, and, and we were talking back and forth. She was very pleased to know that we come into the Catholic faith. Steve, my husband, sent her some articles that I'd written for the Telluride Times Journal. I used to write a humor column for them. And she liked them, and she said, have you ever considered writing a book? And I said, everybody who reads wants to write the great American novel. I mean, yes, of course I've considered it. So she told me to write the first chapter, which is actually the first chapter of uh, Dying for Revenge. And she liked it, and she sort of would, was my midwife. She helped pull the book out of me. Um, so, so there was a piece of the creative learning process that, that very definitely belongs to Doreen, my agent, but it was cathartic, so it just seemed like a good fit. I think for once I actually responded to what the Holy Spirit was nudging me to do. When the book came out, did you release it through the Catholic Writers Guild right at the beginning, or did you discover the Catholic Writers Guild later? Or? I had been uh, in the Catholic Writers Guild for a while. I had Doreen, my agent, shop the book around both to, to secular publishers and to Catholic publishers. As you might imagine, secular publishers were not real thrilled about a book in which the major protagonist is Catholic and very visibly so. And it was kind of interesting because they liked the story and they, they liked the characterization and the writing and everything, but they were just afraid of the religious piece of it. And so Full Quiver Press um, ultimately accepted it and that's, that's how it came out the way it did. And I couldn't be happier. It's been delightful. Were you surprised at the reception it got? I really was. You know, I think one of the things a writer worries about, or at least this writer worried about, was being seen as foolish or terrible or, you know, I mean, the, the bad reviews would get to you. But people have enjoyed it, and I've been interested to see how people who weren't necessarily Catholic have responded to it. Um, and how have they responded to it? It's interesting. They, they like the mystery, and they like the fact that she actually does live out her faith, but they're a little puzzled by the details that are ordinary details to Catholics. So again, it's it's a kind of a stealth evangelization book because they see this and they say, well, what is this business of this rosary? What does that really mean? And why is it so important? Why won't she go to communion? Why, why is that a big deal? So they've asked questions about it, and, and I've done a number of book clubs with people who were not Catholic, and they and they bring those things up. So it's, it's an opportunity to share the faith in a way that we might not otherwise. All right, so now let's go to book two. The second book is dying for compassion now our lady doc is she still in her new location or is she relocated again well she's still in telluride she's uh telluride is in in colorado a place where we have a summer home so it's it's kind of a natural locale for me she's there um the character owen who was in the first book is is in the second book as well um what happens is she starts out in telluride and she gets involved in a case involving euthanasia physician assisted suicide that has just become legal in the state of California. And so she has to, to work through this mystery of, of how a, a number of people have died through that and, and what's really going on. But as that's happening, she also has this sort of bump in the road because a character she's become very fond of in book two, I mean, in book one, asks her to marry him in, in book two. And it turns out that he is divorced civilly, but he has not had an annulment in the Catholic Church, and that's a bump in the road. So she, he, she goes to, um, to Ireland uh, ultimately because he ends up getting accused of murder in Ireland while he's over there trying to sort this out. And without giving too much of the book of the way, it's in Telluride, it's in Ireland, and, she, and Jane is sort of out of, her, out of her ordinary milieu, and she has to figure out what, what this person means to her, what's going on with these deaths back in Telluride. She's got all these balls in the air and trying to figure out where she's going to live her life in, in that confusion. And I think while we don't have those same issues, all of us live those kinds of issues out on a daily basis. And it's kind of fun to watch her come to um, a new person in herself, find out things about herself she didn't know. And that was Barbara Golder. The book is Dying for Compassion, and we'll have part two of that next week. I also, you know, I mentioned the two events that are coming up in October, the one on the 10th and the one on the 24th. 
And there's another thing that's going on that I can't give a lot of details on because I don't have a lot of details on it myself. But uh, we're taking part in a program called Adopt a Bishop. And <laughs> no, we're not asking you to take a bishop into your home and feed him. But uh, what we are asking is that you adopt one of the princes of the church and pray for him on a daily basis. Because one of the things, if you... And I bring this up because I had talked to a priest once. And I had talked to him about the times that the other side, the enemy, had gone after me. And he was talking about the times that the enemy goes after him in our conversation. And it occurs to me, I mean, we're individual um, people. And of course, the enemy wants any soul he can get from Christ. So the enemy will put pressure on us. Now, I'm hosting a Catholic radio show. What I say may affect a few other people, so maybe the enemy goes a little harder, maybe not. But a priest... A priest at the altar is going to be under regular attack because the priest at the altar is the person forming Catholics, doing the Mass, and when a priest is successful, souls are lost to the devil. Souls are lost. The devil can't get those souls. So, so the priest is going to be under attack. So how much more under attack will a bishop be who is supervising priests, who is the public face of a diocese. If we want our bishops to be able to handle everything Satan throws at them, the best thing we can do, rather than complain or moan or anything else, is to pray for them. And to have faith that God will help protect the princes of the church and the priests of the church. So I'll give you more details of the program when, when I have more. But you don't need a program to pick out a bishop right now and decide to start praying for him. I think that's a great idea myself. I wish I had thought of it. But I, can't, I cannot take credit for that one. But whoever thought of it, it is an excellent idea. Well, now it's time for our closing prayer. And we are going to do our closing prayer as we do all of our prayers in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh God of mercy, as we reach out to those seeking you, send forth your Holy Spirit upon this radio station, all the stations carrying us, and all those listening to this show, whether listening to it live, listening to it as a podcast on the site, listening to it uh, on whatever station is carrying us, to renew us in faith. Enable us to share the good news of the gospel with loving words and caring deeds, so that those who have drifted away may be drawn to your church and follow the way of your Son, Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the light. We make our prayer through Jesus our Lord. Amen. And we make it in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, that's just about all the time we have now for your prayer intentions. I want to thank you again for joining us. We will be back here next week with another, hopefully, a show that you'll enjoy <laughs> of your prayer intentions. And we'd like you, as I said, stay tuned to WQPH as we will be we're here 24 hours a day broadcasting Catholic radio. Next is Talk Catholic. Hope you enjoy it. But till then, until next week, this is Peter and Jeremy, author of Hail Mary, the Perfect Protestant and Catholic Prayer, saying goodbye for WQPH. God bless you all. And in the words of St. Pope John Paul II, in this troubled time, be not afraid. This is Peter and Jeremy, host of Your Prayer Intentions, every Saturday here on 89.3 WQPH Shirley Fitchburg. Do you have a prayer request that you'd like me to pray for or perhaps the whole community? Well, include that prayer request in an email. Specify if you want it on air or off and email that prayer request to WQPH893 at Comcast.net. Let me repeat that. It's WQPH893 at Comcast.net. 
and we will pray for you. If you have an urgent request that you're looking for immediate prayer, tweet me directly at the Tech Guy blog on Twitter or the Tech Guy blog on Gab. And as soon as I see it, I will pray for you. God bless you.